I want to thank you for joining us today. It's Friday, February 6th, Jobs Day here in, uh, in the market. And we're going to go ahead and look at a few things that are affecting the market right now. So let's go ahead and get started. Let me get my screen share working here. All right. There we go. Uh, normally when we start these presentations, we talk about the S&P 500. We talk about stocks. But really the name of the game right now is the currency war that is going on uh, here in, uh, in, in, in the world right now. And what you have is you have every major economy trying to devalue their currency right now except the U.S. economy. <laughs> And so as a result, as you can see here on this chart, the U.S. dollar, this is the dollar index comparing the U.S. dollar to a basket of currencies has just been skyrocketing since uh, the middle of last year. And this is, this is pretty significant. This is going all the way back to the early 90s. So you can kind of get an idea here just how unprecedented this move is uh, in such a short period of time. We had a big move up in the dollar back in 08. Uh, obviously, a lot of other things were happening then as well, and a lot of volatility in, in currencies back then. But we feel like this is pretty significant. Uh, we're not quite sure the dollar can continue to move up at this level. We wouldn't be surprised if we saw a little reprieve here. But, uh, but the name of the game right now is the dollar, uh, currencies, as well as world central banks basically bringing their interest rates down to zero, down to nothing. In uh, instigating these quantitative easing programs where they're going out, they're buying assets, they're trying to flood their markets with liquidity, they're trying to keep interest rates low. And as you can see here, this is looking at um, you know a lot of the major markets in the world. Uh, Short-term interest rates, you know, for most of Europe are pretty much at zero or at nothing. In the United States, is still pretty low as well. It's not like we've got super high interest rates here either. But uh, you know, Japan's pretty low. Uh, you know, the only places where interest rates are somewhat high, uh, India, Brazil, of course, Russia's got a whole another another can of worms that they're dealing with. But um, so when we look at, you know, from an investing standpoint, and we're looking at the big picture, what we're really looking at here is, yeah, I mean, the stock market's important. I mean, so a lot of these other things are important, but really the, the, the game changer right now that's driving everything is world central banks bringing their uh, interest rates down. And then all this money is flooding into the U.S. market because they think that we're going to be the first one to raise interest rates. So a lot of money is coming in, buying short-term assets, and then, you know, with the hope that six months from now or whatever, interest rates are going to start going up, and that's going to uh, uh, be, a, you know, be a driver for that. Um, this is the way we want to go. Uh, this is the U.S. This is the yellow line here is the S&P 500 going all the way back to 2010. The uh, blue line are the assets on the uh, Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And again, this, this kind of gets back to, you know, I was talking about earlier about central banks is that when a, when a central bank does a quantitative easing program, what they're doing is they're buying assets. They're increasing the size of their balance sheet. So, you know, before the, the crisis, there really wasn't much going on. Then, you know, Fed started buying assets like crazy, what happened? The stock market went up. Fed paused, and then we got some volatility in the market, and then you know, back in 2013, the Fed went on this big binge of buying assets, and it really pushed the market up. Now the Fed is you know, basically stalled and, and is kind of holding out now and not buying anything, so it'll be interesting to see what, the, what stocks do. The Fed was really the first to this game, and now all these other central banks are trying to catch up and implement the same thing essentially buying these assets and hopefully uh, propping, up their, propping up their stock markets as a result of it. Uh, and really what happens is when the Fed does this, it puts interest rates low, which allows companies to go out and to issue debt. And sure enough, last year we had a record year of corporate debt issuance. Year before that was a record year, year before that was a record year. So you know, if we go back and we look, that's all this period in here or what's the Fed? The Fed is really keeping rates artificially low, so it allows companies to go out, issue debt, 
at very, very low interest rates, okay? And so sure enough, the past few years, we've seen record uh, issuance in corporate debt. And then what do they do with that money? Well, they're buying back their own shares. They're raising dividends. They're, they're doing things to basically lift their stock prices, which sure enough, we see here over the past few years, stocks have really, you know, large stocks especially have really gone up. Uh, this chart here shows you, this is an index, this blue and, um, excuse me, the red and green line is an index of companies that all they're doing is they're, they're big buyer buyers of their own shares, uh, where the blue line is just the S&P 500. Well, sure enough, again, getting back into this picture here, this 2012 to 2014, where you've really started to see that separation between the two, right, was this period in here, the Fed's buying assets, keeping interest rates low, companies are going out, what are they doing? They're, they're selling debt, they're getting cheap, cheap, cheap financing, and what are they doing with the money? They're buying back shares, they're raising dividends, they're not, they're not necessarily expanding operations or CapEx spending or hiring people or doing a lot of those things to grow their businesses, but they're certainly doing things to keep their, their share price going higher, okay? Uh, this here is just a chart that, that kind of shows us where we're at in the year. January is typically an up year. Well, we didn't have an up year this, uh, here in 2015. It was actually a down year for the market. February historically has been a down year. And actually right now uh, we're up for the month of February. So it'll be interesting to see how this month plays out. These don't always work out perfectly, but just going back to 1942 just gives us kind of an average and a median of, of what, what tends to happen. One of the negatives that we're seeing in the stock market right now is a well, when we look at what we call spreads. And all this really is, is this black line is the yield on a 10-year treasury. And, you know, yields have really dropped here recently, really, really come down. And this uh, orange line here are the yields of this is a corporate master. So it's kind of like a big index of just corporate bonds. And what we're seeing is we're seeing this spread begin to rise. And typically when you see spreads expand, it's what we call a, um, a risk off environment, meaning that there's not a lot of demand coming in to corporate bonds right now, which, you know, as, as price is people would buy more corporate bonds uh, and be huge demand there, we would start to see these rates drop. Where all this money's going is actually going into treasuries right now, which is kind of a fear trade or people are, you know, not willing to take too much risk. So typically when spreads are narrowing, meaning, meaning like if you look at this period here from 2012 into, into the middle of last year, when spreads were narrowing, money was, was going into corporate debt and we were seeing lower rates and these spreads come together. Well, now you really begin to see a little bit of the opposite. So it's 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 got a scratch in our heads right now because the market's still hanging in there. It's still doing well, but we're continuing to see these spreads uh, widen here a little bit. Uh, we'd like to see this turn, you know, either top out or flatten or begin to go lower here, which would be some confirmation for us that you know the market, you know, should probably continue to move higher because investors are willing to take some risk. And right now we're we're not seeing that at this point. So it's just a kind of a check that we have as we evaluate stocks. Uh, speaking of interest rates, this is the 10 year treasury yield going all the way back to the forties. Of course, the forties and the eighties, we had this big run up in rates. And then since 81, it's been a downward trend in rates. And we still think that the, the trend is still down. Uh, it might take a while for rates to bottom along here before we really start to see a move higher. And right now we're just, you know, we're, we, we just had a big move down in rates. Uh, you know, we couldn't be, we wouldn't be surprised. We see a little move up higher, but we think rates will probably stay low for a while. And if you look historically, I mean, from 1941 to 1953, I mean, that's a 12 year period. Rates were pretty much somewhere right around 2% on a 10 year treasury. That's a 12 year period of 2% yields on a 10 year treasury. So, uh, you know, is, is that to say 12 years from now, 10 year treasury is going to be at 2%. I don't know. But if it is, it wouldn't be unprecedented. So uh, when we look at interest rates, we really need to look at the big picture here and make sure we're, we're, we're taking all that in. Uh, and this, I showed this last month. This is basically a chart that's just showing you that historically, 
we're really at the low end of what the historic yield ranges are on these different fixed income investments, which is just means that, yeah, you know, rates may stay low for a while. And so you may not lose a ton of money in fixed income, but is it really going to be a place where you're going to see, you know, a lot of potential for return at this point, we're just not, we're just not sure right now. Uh, this is a yield curve. So, right. This is, interest rates, right? So this is the overnight rate, three month rate, six months, you know, all the way out to a 30 year bond. And what we do is we just plot what each interest rate is for those maturities. So a year ago, we had what was called a steep yield curve. So we, we you know, short term rates right now are pretty much at zero. And then as you went out the uh, maturity scale, you obviously got a little bit more. Well, as we've seen rates, at, rates that have dropped here recently, right? This is a 10 year yield it's dropped dramatically. I mean, it's gone from around almost 3% down to 1.68. Uh, you know, we've seen this 10 year, you know, really come down. It's flattened the yield curve. So right now the yield curve is flattening, which in a healthy economy, you really want a steep yield curve because banks make money. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a healthier environment. A steep yield curve, I mean, excuse me, a flat yield curve uh, is not always necessarily a good thing uh, for the for the economy either. And the real question is if the Fed starts to raise rates, because when you talk about the Fed raising rates, see this target, that's what they're raising. So if the Fed starts to raise, raise rates and move this higher, then you get a really flat yield curve. And then if they actually keep moving up and long rates stay low, you get what's called an inverted yield curve. Anytime there's been an inverted yield curve, we've had a recession. So we certainly don't want to see that happen either. But this is what's interesting. We take this yield curve and then we subtract out the inflation rate. And that gives us what we call is our real rate of return. And any U.S. Treasury three years or less. Now, keep in mind, inflation is only about one and a half percent. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of uh, a lot right now. I mean, inflation is ridiculously low, but at one and a half percent, Anything less than three years and you're losing money. You're, you're, not even, you're not even keeping up with the inflation rate. But even at a 10-year yield, you're only making, uh, I don't know, let's see here, one, you know, you're, you're making less than 1% even at a 10-year yield right now. So uh, when you consider, and this is really low inflation, imagine if we had 2 3 4% inflation right now, well, you pretty much, even on a 30-year bond, you'd be losing money at this point if rates were the same. Rates would obviously move a little higher with, uh, with higher inflation, but uh, you know, fixed, fixed income, especially on the treasury side, it's not looking very promising. It's a very safe place to be today, but when you look out over the next five to 10 years, in our opinion, it's just not a very, very promising place to be uh, at this point. Again, this is the dollar uh, on, a, on a kind of a shorter scale than we were looking last time, but you can just see this, this really big move that we have had here over the past, uh, you know, past six months. Uh, and, and as a result of that, here's a few charts I just want us to look at that I think have really benefited. This is the Russell 2000, which is small cap stocks, right? So think about small cap companies. They're here in the United States. They do most of their business in the United States. So they don't really care for a lot of these companies unless they're exporting. If the dollar's rising or going down, you know, you know, I own a Quiznos sub shop, right? And I'm selling to people here in the United States. What do I care, right? But if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm like here in the, you know, here in South Carolina, here in the Upstate, if I'm BMW, right? I'm a big multinational. I'm building. I'm making all these cars here in the United States. And I'm shipping them down to Charleston and sending them out all over the world. And oh my goodness, a rising dollar is hurting me big time because now. Uh, you know, my cars are a lot more expensive to the rest of the world. So as the dollar has been rising, what we've seen here in terms of, rel we've seen, you know, small caps didn't have a great year last year. I mean, they were pretty much flat for the year. But over the past, you know, few months here, we've started to see a move up in small cap stocks. And when you compare it to the S&P 500, we've actually seen some improvement there too, where it's actually outperforming some of these multinational, big multinational companies. And I think the dollar has, has a lot to do with that. Same thing uh, with these next two charts. This is Europe. So if you own uh, international investments, which, you know, if you're diversified, you, you will own some international investments. You can see here when the dollar started rallying uh, in the summer, uh, Europe, 
your, your European holdings have dropped considerably. Now, let's take that dollar out of the mix and let's say you just bought European stocks and euros. Well, that's a whole different picture, isn't it? Going, even going back to that June, July, you're actually at all, you know, all time highs here where if you own it in US dollars, you're still way down here because uh, the dollar has rallied so much against the euro. So it is really has affected the average investor's international holdings here recently, this big move up in the dollar that we've seen uh, since June, July of last year. This is gold and I thought it was interesting. We, we looked at gold last month and said, you know, it still hasn't kind of popped up here yet. And, and sure enough, it's, it's made, made a little bit of a move here, which, you know, inflation around the world that we looked at earlier is pretty much low. So, you know, you're not buying gold necessarily for an inflationary hedge, but I think a lot of people may, may be considering buying into gold right now uh, as a currency hedge because their currencies are being devalued so much. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of money going into gold. I, I still think it might be a little too early to say, hey, gold's moving higher from here, but this is something that's really sh at the top of our radar right now as we, we continue to watch. Uh, of course, oil, we've talked about this. You know, we, we, we've been saying this all year. When oil breaks $80 a barrel, watch out. And sure enough, it fell like a rock. Uh, past couple of weeks, we've seen a, you know, a little move up here. Is oil bottoming? I have no idea. But... Uh, you know, do I think most of the damage is done in the price of oil? Probably. You know, when, when the article came out a couple weeks ago that we were going to see $20 oil, I started to feel like, all right, we, we're probably getting near a bottom. Because back when oil was $140 a barrel, back in, was it 2007, 2008, there was all those articles coming out, $200 oil. Of course, that never happened either. So usually when the press starts reporting these extremes, you're getting at or near a bottom. We wouldn't be surprised if we saw oil start to firm up in here. I'm not certainly going to call a bottom or anything like that, but it, it certainly seems like this, this big, powerful move down is, has run out of some steam. Whoa, what are all these colors and arrows and everything like that I'm looking at? Well, this is where, this is our kind of our global market heat map, if you want to call it that. And what we do is we look at, these are all the different domestic markets, domestic sectors, commodities, currencies, foreign countries, global regions, and then fixed income. And this just, it's a great way to just look at kind of the, a lot of the world markets and see, hey, what's up, what's down, what's positive, what's negative, what's green, what's red, you know, and you can just kind of get a, a, a good indication there. But here's what's interesting. If you look last year in 2014, right, look at the U.S. stock markets, you know, well, U.S. stock market, but even all the pieces of the U.S. stock market pretty much were in the green. World markets, except for China and India, were all in the red. Global regions, all in the red. Well, let's flip over to year to date, which has been kind of interesting. You're starting to see some green come in here, and you're also starting to see, you know, even some world regions uh, very much outperform the U.S. markets so far this year. Uh, I think that is a development to really, really keep an eye on. I mean, look at over the last month, you look at a lot of green in here. And over, you know, over here, you know, not as much. So I would say that, uh, you know, in, you know, in some of these world markets right now, uh, you know, if you if you had world markets last year, you underperformed vastly. But we're starting to see a little bit of a change. You know, we're only one month pretty much into the year, but it is, I think, somewhat significant that we need to take take note of here. Commodities are still. Showing some weakness, I mean, not obviously not as much, but you know they're still down. Of course, like I mentioned earlier, gold and silver are up for the year. Currencies, again, if you're not the U.S. dollar, you're still pretty much down for the most part. Uh, bonds are still positive, again, not by a lot, but still still positive. Of course, 30-year bond last year was a good place to be. And then, if we look at sectors, what's interesting here is if we look year to date. Um, your worst sector is actually uh, financials. And if we go back a few slides and we talk about that yield curve that we were looking at, that it's flattening, because what do banks do, right? Banks pay practically nothing on deposits and what they do, they lend 30 year mortgages and things like that. Well, when this yield curve flattens, their margins get squeezed and they make less money. And that's, so we've seen this yield curve 
flattening here. And sure enough, financials are your worst sector year to date. Best sector is actually materials right now. Healthcare continues to be strong. Utilities continue to be strong. Uh, discretionary has really come on lately. And so has, um, so has energy uh, here. You know, as, as, as I mentioned earlier that, you know, maybe, maybe we're starting to see a little bit of a bottom here and some money starting to flow back in energy stocks. So we continue, you know, we're watching the Federal Reserve, world central banks for their actions. Um, whether deflation stabilizes or intensifies, a trend and strength of the U.S. dollar and the devaluation of world currencies, that's really the name of the game right now. We, you know, we're really looking at this price of oil to stabilize. And the one thing I didn't put in here, you know, of course, gold, I think that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And then whether we're in risk off or risk on characteristics, frankly, we're seeing a little of both right now. We're seeing some risk off characteristics with the, um, you know, that spread that I was showing you and those in interest rates beginning to rise. And then we're seeing risk on characteristics as well. Small caps outperforming large caps is typically a risk on characteristic. So what I'll go ahead and do is I am going to stop here and we're gonna go ahead and open it up for, um, for questions. So here we go.